Welcome to this uh, AISEA roundtable discussions with Abraham and the AISEA Institute. We are so happy to be here. This is going to be the first of five uh, we are going to do. And today we have the pleasure to have um, Marcy Campbell and, and Abraham and I'm Rodolfo Vergara. I'm a volunteer for the AISEA Institute. And let's, let's begin. Marcy, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I feel very honored to be asked to be to participate in this. So thank you very much for having me. A little bit about me. I felt very strongly maybe uh, 15 years ago to start studying the Old Testament. And as you study the Old Testament, you find, well, first of all, that there's so much that you don't know. And then it's difficult at that time to continue to find more and more and more about the Old Testament. But of course, it lends itself into Isaiah. Everything lands at Isaiah when you study the scriptures. And so I began studying Isaiah um, the best I could with the resources that I could find. I was studying it alone. I didn't know anybody else that was interested at the time to study Isaiah with me. So I was doing everything I could to try to find it, uh, out more about Isaiah. I think it was very helpful learning the history and the timelines in the Old Testament. Um, but for me, Isaiah became a message that was speaking to my soul on a different, I would just call it a different wavelength where it, it was calling me and it was rhythmically speaking to me, even in ways that I probably didn't know. And it was a, a, a pleasure and a joy that I'd never experienced before. So very grateful to have somehow come across Isaiah Institute and, um, and all that you have to offer there. It's been, it's been a great pleasure for me. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. And my, my experience similar to, I love the scriptures and I remember that I couldn't move on, um, especially with the Book of Mormon, if I um, didn't understood Isaiah better and not just better, just trying to unlock what he was trying to say. And I always knew there was something there, but I was hitting a wall until, until my wife got me a book from Abraham, uh, Windows of Prophecy. And then there was just a few things that really opened the gate to, to really dive in into and make sense of things. Um, and Abraham, I know most people know you, but we will have uh, new people watching this. Can you tell us about, about yourself and, and your work? Um, how did you were led to, to find all of these literary tools and, and so on? Sure. Yeah, um, I was uh, I was raised in New Zealand, where during my youth I uh, read Isaiah after studying the Old Testament, New Testament, then the Old Testament, and I somehow connected with Isaiah more than with any other thing in the Old Testament, and um, knew that somehow that it applied to, to modern times. I didn't know how because it was grounded back in history, you know, Isaiah's day. So um, and later on, when I was in Israel in rabbinic school, the rabbi mentioned that. Isaiah related to his own day and to the end time, um, and, but they didn't have the proof it was a Jewish tradition. And of course, Jesus repeats that in 35, 23, that all things that Isaiah speak have been and shall be. So then later on when I joined the church and uh, worked during my PhD program at BYU, I discovered the literary proof in a, in a, in a literary structure that uh, William Brownlee discovered in the Dead Sea Scroll of Isaiah, um, a very complex structure, but it simplified everything with it. It totally transported the entire book of Isaiah onto an end times, as an, into an end time scenario that uses history, ancient history as an allegory of the end time. So that's kind of started my career. Then I did a modern translation of Isaiah because it's really hard. It's almost impossible really to understand Isaiah in the King James Version. So I did my own translation, which became the Isaiah Institute translation that we now use and that we're going to be using here today and in these uh, series of five videos. And uh, let's, okay, let's go from there. That's perfect. Right. Yes. And by the way, the translation is in IsaiahExplain.com. Um, there we have the Abraham's uh, translation. And today we are going to go over... Um, Isaiah Explained is a... For the reader's benefit, is a listener's benefit, is a website www.isaiahexplain.com. It uh, has that translation, commentaries, and a lot of free material on the Book of Isaiah. 
exactly and people love that that side um okay today we're going over isaiah 1 to 12 and and we titled this prelude to god's judgment and and before the event abraham you you mentioned um you want to go maybe to some literary keys uh, to isaiah as an introduction um well i think we can talk about some literary keys to isaiah as we go along Okay. That's one of the things that this literary structure that I discovered in Isaiah, well, that was discovered by Brownlee, but that I that I analyzed and I, you know, I discovered other literary structures as well, superimposed over it. Um, and then the keywords, code names, word links, typologies. Uh, those things are very simple literary keys that help us understand the book of Isaiah as an end time scenario um, so that the ancient names become code names for um, end time nations and people, uh, which which makes it very relative to us today. And that's how we should, Nephi says, apply it to ourselves for our profit and learning, because especially now in the time for the second coming, which is what Isaiah's scenario is all about. And then then with that, who, who will be Latter-day Saints today um, if we try to superimpose that, that prophecy to our day? Right, good question. That is, that has to be the Lord's people today. The Latter Day Saints. We are the we are the Israel that uh, <clears throat> that in the beginning of Isaiah's scenario comes under condemnation, comes under judgment, and 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 it goes it gets worse from there, because for somehow we have become very materialistic and idolatrous and um, and addicted to to worldliness and to things of the world that. Um, that are distracting us from, from the Lord. So from, from, from our task as Latter-day Saints in, in, in our role being to bring about the restoration of the house of Israel, the Jews, the 10 tribes and Lamanites of today, and we have not been doing that. We have not even hardly addressed that question, let alone got our own acts together. So, yeah. Well, that's wonderful. Mar Marcy, you have anything to add before jump in? Well, that just reminds me of my, one of my favorite verses in Isaiah chapter six. Um, it, it has to do with, are we able to see? Are we able to be aware, right? See with their eyes, ear with their hear, understand with your hearts. And be healed, right? Right. And that is, that just is the message over and over again, is that awareness. Can you see? Can you see the state that you're in? Can you see the state the world is in? Can you see? Um, maybe what it is that God wants us to be doing. Wonderful. And, and Abraham, let, let's go maybe do an overview from 1 to 12, um, what these chapters are about. Right. Um, they are basically God's condemning his people of the day, his day and also our day. Now, not this time it's us. We can't point the finger at anybody else today because it's speaking to, to God's common people of today. And those chapters are also written verbatim, except for chapter one, in the Book of Mormon, in, in, second, in, in second Nephi. So chapters two through 14 are written there and scribed for us. And you ask, well, what, you know, why would they be there if it's just of historical interest, since the whole Book of Mormon is intended for Latter-day readers? And the reason is because Isaiah's scenario is intended is an end time scenario and we have to learn from those chapters in Isaiah about what's going to happen to us and to the world and what happens to the world is uh, when God's people come under condemnation for for rebelling or rejecting the greater truths of the gospel basically and uh, staying with the basic principles only and not not the fullness of the gospel but basically purport, purporting that the what is only the basic principles is the fullness of the gospel, and it's not. Those kinds of things, and, and our materialism, and our worship of idols, modern idols we're talking about, not statues, um, then, you know, that is the prelude to God's worldwide judgment. That is the catalyst, the great catalyst for, for the end time judgments that come upon the entire world, and God's people themselves. Uh, because if, if we maintain our righteousness, you know, by God's definition of righteousness and not our self-righteousness, then, then no world power could come and do that, do that kind of thing. And, and that is 
that, that is what we're going to talk about today. Perfect. And Rudolfo, I just remember reading the Book of Mormon and finally something hitting me that was the Book of Mormon and even those chapters of Isaiah. It was written for us as Latter-day Saints. Who is going to be reading the Book of Mormon in today's world, right? I think for so long and so many people think the Book of Mormon is written as a warning for all the people that we go out to the world to convert, but it's written for people who have made those covenants. It's written for his covenant people. And, and so we need to have our eyes opened to all of the hiccups that could be happening with his people in the end time, right? And so it just seems to me when you read the Book of Mormon from the perspective of this was written for me, not just the people that we're trying to do missionary work for, but this is written for me. What is it saying that could be potential pitfalls for us in this time period? That, that's wonderful, uh, Marcy, because that, that what probably led me to Isaiah was to understand who the Gentiles were in the Book of Mormon, so prominent with Nephi. And then I realized he's talking about us. Um, and then when Christ comes in 3 Nephi, uh, those chapters 16, 20, 21, and then in 23 he mentioned that um, all the words of Isaiah has been and shall be. And then he said he must speak to the Gentiles. Um, and then if, if you read the Book of he he's speaking to us. Uh, I love that. Uh, well, uh, Abraham, let's jump into the, the blocks, right? Yes. And okay, so the first block will be Isaiah 1, 2, and 4. Abraham? Yeah. Uh, would someone like to read that? Uh, oh, I can read it. Whichever. I'll read it for you. All right. Hear, hear, O heavens, give heed, O earth. The Lord has spoken. I have reared sons, brought them up, but they have revolted against me. The ox knows its owner the ass its master's stall, but Israel does not know. My people are insensible. Alas, a nation astray, a people weighed down by sin, the offspring of wrongdoers, perverse children. They have forsaken the Lord. They have spurned the Holy One of Israel. They have lapsed into apostasy. Yeah, so they've gone away backwards. They've backslided into, into apostasy. And uh, like you say, they don't see, they don't hear the ox. The people are insensible. They've become insensible over time, but they don't, they don't even know it. Because when you're spiritually blind, you don't realize you are. So over several generations, as you can see there, the offspring of wrongdoers, peristula, um, they've just kind of slipped away into an, into an apostasy that they don't even realize. And uh, like, like other people that, who've done that, the Jews and the Nephites and others, without realizing it. So... Let's, let's go to uh, the next scripture, Rodolfo, and see what the outcome is. Um, okay, I can read that one. Okay. Had not the Lord of hosts left us a few survivors, we should have been as Sodom or become like Gomorrah. Hear the words of the Lord, all leaders of Sodom. Give heed to the love of our God, you people of Gomorrah. Yeah, when he starts talking about Sodom and Gomorrah, that's pretty ominous language because those people were destroyed by a rain of fire brimstone out of the sky. And only Lot and his two daughters were saved out of it for Abraham's sake, it says in Genesis. So that means that there will only be a few survivors of us, of the Latter-day Saints, compared to the whole, because we have gone the way of Sodom and the way of Gomorrah, which, as you know, were sins of perversity and, and injustices and oppression persecution and uh, so the Lord now is addressing our leaders calling us the, pe the people of Gomorrah and the leaders of Sodom and that we need to go back to the basics to the law of our God to the fullness of the gospel <clears throat> which if we knew what that is then we'd be totally on a different plane than we are today yeah let, let me ask a question with that because it's a very um, negative, these people look like they were, Isaiah has mentioned that, it's the evil doings and, and all of that. Uh, but Marcy, if you read, you, you mentioned about the history, uh, the people here, the kingdom of Judah, they were, keep the law of Moses, they were doing the things, they were doing the sacrifices and the offerings. Um, what do you think went wrong? Because they have the form, right? Like Paul mentioned sometimes, the form of godliness 
um, but then there was something missing. Well, I think number one, I guess the scriptures always talk about pride. So when when pride enters in in its many nefarious forms, it, it's sometimes really difficult to see that we even have it. It's incredibly difficult, and and so I think it's it's little by little, and then people cannot see it as. Abraham mentioned it's difficult to see or to know, right? And it's in some ways it's as a people, and then in some ways it's individually. And the one thing for me personally, I think none of us are here to be perfect, and we're not going to be perfect. And so I personally don't feel like everyone should always just go around feeling bad about themselves that they are so close to Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know that that's going to be helpful in their life. I think that we can do the best we can with the time that we're given here. I don't like it. I personally don't like the feeling of hopelessness of like, oh my goodness, we're some, you know, I'm in trouble. I've done so much or whatever. I'm, I'm so imperfect every day. And that can be really problematic also to have to wake up with those kind of feelings. So I, I'd like to be aware of, of our own weaknesses and pitfalls that we can fall into. And that is also one of them. But I do think that um, when we've had a life of ease, for a certain number of years, which in the United States, there's been quite a bit of ease for a long time overall in general. And I think that's when sometimes people forget to do the self check of what is it the Lord wants me to be doing right now. Yeah, Marcy, I agree. And, and also these first two videos that we're doing on the, uh, that correspond with the come follow me scriptures. Um, they're the bad news of Isaiah <laughs> um, that we need to get past uh, by dealing with it, not by ignoring it. Oh, that's too uncomfortable to deal with and I don't want to go even look at that. No, we really have to take this and all our fears to task and say, okay, what is it that we need to repent of? What is it that we're, so that we can get our acts together and qualify for those glorious blessings that are incomparable toward the end of the book of Isaiah. No other prophet has those incomparable, has those blessings as, as Isaiah does. So, yeah, so let's just face the music and. Right. <laughs> and I do think studying history helps that because you can really look at history and say, it really, it did happen. What could they have done better? It did happen. What could they have done to continue to stay close to the Lord um, throughout each individual person's journey, right? So. Yes. When people be, felt very afraid 2020 and post 2020 and would talk to me about it, or even in the Isaiah study groups, and they were very fearful about, oh no, this things are happening. I'm sensing things are happening and now I'm afraid. And for me, I think bringing it down to a really simple place of saying, what is it, what kind of light can you share to the world in the time that you have? What kind of light that you can bring into your life that you can share to the world? I, I feel like is a really great place to start. I love that. One, one thing you I learned this year too was, for example, some of the oracles um, that were given to all of these nations uh, in Isaiah, the, the word oracle also in Hebrew means the, the burden. And, and the, the reason why it was a burden was meant for them to create pressure so they can react. And, and technically it was a blessing for them. Something terrible is coming. Isaiah poetic language depicted things in a way that was uh, the, the, the worst. And, and he's very good to cast that using uh, some uh, mythology, the, the, the destruction and chaos and, and all of that. But the, the objective was for them to, to repent and react, uh, which uh, we are going to see that through Isaiah. There are groups that they... Uh, they take the, the call and, and they, they repent and people act differently. Some, some are going to be terrified and act in fear and they're going to blunder because of that. Others are going to learn how to find protection and so on. Uh, Abraham, one, one thing that you mentioned to me uh, that, well, to us, that's been very instructive to see the whole prophecy uh, is the idea of the domino effect or the domino fashion, because this is the first piece, then everything is a consequence of that. And maybe that will be a, we can now go to the next topic that because of this, the, there is a figure that's coming, which is called the king of Assyria. 
Am I right? Let's, yeah, let's go back to the first scripture reference that you had a moment ago. Yeah, that one. And that is really the first domino right there that you're talking about. And, and when we really understand that Isaiah is, is the prophet of the end time, there is no, no other prophet that compares, not, not Book of Revelation, no other. That's why Jesus makes it a commandment and all Book of Mormon prophets and Jesus himself in, in 3 Nephi. When they talk about the end time, it's Isaiah, Isaiah is their go-to person. So if you want to learn about the end time, the time preceding the coming of the Lord, this is it. Isaiah is it. Come to terms with Isaiah, learn, learn a few literary tools, and learn the message because it will carry you through all the way. And yes, there are these domino effects that the domino effect that happens, and bad things will take overtake the entire world, including right here in you know, among us ourselves, uh, among the Lord's people today. But what Isaiah shows is the way through this, if you'll truly embrace, you know, what the gift of God in the scriptures, what what and and the gospel, the fullness of the restored gospel, what the Lord has restored through the prophet Joseph Smith. Even though Isaiah's scenario is not about the time of Joseph Smith, but it's about the end time for which the, the gospel through Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon and so forth has laid a foundation. And that foundation is really important to stay with and keep intact and not jump ship. And then when we do so, we'll have the Holy Ghost to lead us through and we'll have the, the power of the priesthood that will again be exercised to carry us through this time. So yeah, this is the first domino, Adolfo, is the backsliding of the most people. That is the prelude to all the other things that will follow in quick succession, like falling dominoes, that ends up finally with the coming of the Lord in glory to the New Jerusalem and to the, to the world at large. Yeah. Okay, so do you want to move into the next then piece on Isaiah 10? Sure. Okay, and do you want to maybe read that Abraham and <laughs> tell us what this is about? Yeah, so Isaiah then gives a warning that um, there's a day coming, a day of reckoning, or the, the day of the Lord, which we cover in the next video. What will you do in the day of reckoning when the Holocaust overtakes you from afar? It really is a nuclear disaster, a third world war a scenario. You can't really get away from that when you read Isaiah and other prophets. So whom will you flee for help? Where will you leave your wealth? The thing that you covet right now, the thing that the world, the arm of flesh that you rely on, to, to get help and aid, not going to be there. Only the Lord's going to be there. There shall nothing remain but to kneel among the captives that fall among the slain, if you rely on the world. Yet for all this, his anger is not abated, his hand is upraised still. So there you have, you see two words that are bolded, anger and hand. And those are things that the king of Assyria personifies. He embodies God's anger. God is not an angry God, but he the king of Assyria is like kind of a Hitler, a very angry person. He's the Antichrist of the end time. He's the beast in the book of Revelation. He's also the Lord's hand of punishment, his left hand, his hand of punishment. Let's move on. Did someone else read that? I think it's my turn. Hail the Assyrian, the rod of my anger. He is a staff, my wrath in their hand. So I like that you've bolded so that people can see the parallelism of those words, <clears throat> the wrath in their hand. I will commission him against a godless nation, appoint him over the people deserving of my vengeance, to pillage for plunder, to spoil, spoilate for spoil, to tread underfoot like mud in the streets. Nevertheless, it shall not seem so to him. This shall not be what he has in mind. His purpose shall be to annihilate and to exterminate nations, not a few. Well, it's a very um, terrifying uh, picture if you if you understand maybe the, the history of what the Assyrians did before, because Isaiah is using them. That was one of the, the, the first superpowers really to, to take over um, much of the, 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 the Middle East back then. And they have this campaign, right, um, that the king of Assyria put himself as a as a God, and Isaiah is using him as the end time figure of this Antichrist who is going to do the same. Um, do you have any thoughts on that, Marcy? 
as you read these verses of, of... again I, I feel like I go back to history but I think I mean I think you said it well when we look at what did Assyria do in the time period that it was in power but also I think it's really important the theme of the political environment that is used to help teach us of the political scenario and time. And it, it seems really relevant to try to pay attention. What is going on in the world? What is going on locally, politically? What is going on at your state or your country, et cetera, and, and in the world? Because Isaiah really teaches us through those um, political pieces, right? The, the puzzle pieces, a lot of it had to do with the political conditions of their time. Yeah, love that. And you see the the, the, the parallels there uh, today, especially as, as one thing that um, I, I, I learned from myself, chapter five, was that the Lord has this, 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 this vineyard, right? And then um, because he was expecting something and then we got not that, like he was expecting grapes, but then there we have wild grapes, grapes, and then he mentioned that he was expecting righteousness, and there was an outcry. Then the protection that that place had is going to be removed, and that you see that that some of the 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 signs that that's happening is, is this noise of secret combinations, uh, or wars and rumors of wars that ca- happen as a covenant course. Um, Abraham, do you want to expound on, on, on these verses on, on the king of Assyria? And... Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, the allegory of, of the olive, well, the, the grapes, the vineyard in Isaiah chapter 5, um, where he's expecting fruit, good fruit, but he's expecting, but what he's getting is uh, the Ushim in Hebrew means fruit that kind of rots before it matures, before, rots before it ripens. And that's a description of the Lord's people today, or Isaiah's description of the Lord's people, at least at the time that this scenario acts itself out. And uh, but we already see the Assyrian, kind of an Assyrian nation. And Assyria is a, is a nation in the north. It's always associated, associated with the north. And the Assyrians had an alliance. They formed an alliance of several nations that conquered the world in Isaiah's day. But this is the scenario that's going to repeat itself in our day. They're going to conquer the modern world. And, um, and the only great superpower that can withstand it is in Isaiah's day was Egypt. But Egypt was uh, going down the tubes. Uh, it was corrupt. And as, as Marcy said, the political condition kind of created the ground for that, paved the way for it. And if we don't, you know, if we buy into all of the, the fake news that comes out through the, through the media today, and we don't use our minds to worship God and figure things out and process through the, through what's the lies and, and look what people's actions are, not what their words are. Then, you know, if we don't see that, those things, we will just remain in our blindness. So here we see the Lord commissioning the king of Assyria, basically the Antichrist against his own people, the godless nation, he calls them, the people deserving of his vengeance. Vengeance is another thing that the king of Assyria personifies. But, you know, he, unbeknownst to the king of Assyria, the, the Lord is using him, but he, he simply, he simply intends to conquer the world. And he does so and exterminates. But about 90% of the Earth's population is going to die uh, before the coming of the Lord. Yeah. Wow. So a parallel here that I see Abraham with the godless, godless nation, and then in, in Isaiah 1, 4, a nation astray. Um, so then I says giving giving us some hint who he is gonna come after. Um, and then verse seven is very this, this, is the, this, is, this is one of the dominoes. He's the king of Assyria is one of the dominoes you're talking about. Yeah. And in yeah. verse seven, Marcy, you see that he has a commission to do, right? He's gonna he has a very specific thing. However, he also has a plan on his own. Um, nevertheless, it shall not seem to him that the Lord had that commission uh, because he's going to try to then take over the whole world. And going back to that political round that you are very familiar with that, Marcy, and what power that does to people. And we see here that because of that, uh, we're going we're gonna to get into massive travel. Do you have any thoughts on some of well, that? I, I do think that the Book of Mormon gives us some 
insight kind of to how political conditions work. And I think the key to it is understanding that there is secrecy and corruption in backroom deal making in, in those types of things. So what is presented is we're great. Everything's great. Everybody's doing great. And then there are these secret things going on behind closed doors that um, I do think in the end, it, it's problematic. It becomes very problematic. And it's the word that a lot of people like to use, which is corruption, which is the one thing that I feel like I, I wish I could do more about. That's the one thing I wish I could do more about. Because the truth is, I feel like sometimes even in corruption, there are people working that don't even realize they're involved in it, right? Because it's presented in such a happy way, or this will be good for everybody kind of a way. And I, I like to think there's a lot of politicians who think that they're doing good things and the right things, but then are just not aware themselves. Yeah. That, a little that, lie here, a little secret there, a little lie there, a little secret here. And that's one of yeah. the characteristics of the end time, I see that people love and believe a lie. And they love and believe a lie because they've been deceiving themselves about themselves. Mm -hmm. that, that there's a lot of self-deception going on. And a lot of going through the motions of worship of God, because if you belong to the church, we're saved. If we're, no, we're not. Um, not necessarily at all. Um, yeah, there's this kind of sense of entitlement that, that will not allow us to look past our, our little boxes that we're in, that we put ourselves in, and uh, look past at what's really going on in the world around us. Well, everything will be all right. You know what? Isaiah spells that out. Everything is not going to be all right. And the sooner you come to terms with it, the better and clear the air of what's fake and what's real, um, then, then we'll be prepared for the, for the time that's, you know, here, it's starting now, yeah. And Isaiah mentioned some of that in, in, in words, uh, in Isaiah 7, he mentioned an evil plot between an alliance between Ephraim and Damascus, and in Isaiah 16, he also mentioned this idea of a false propaganda and, and so on, and Isaiah, 19, we see also uh, the things that Egypt is trying to do, and all of those are hints for what the Book of Mormon also is warning us about secret combinations. One oh, thing, no, no, so, excuse me, um, no doubt the name Egypt is a code name for America today. We are Joseph, we're Joseph in Egypt. Egypt was the great superpower of Isaiah's day, and we're it. There's no other candidate. Um, but let's, we should move on soon to the a little bit of good news here that's going on at the same time as the Assyrian destruction of the world and conquest of the world. And that is um, the restoration of the house of Israel. Okay, so this is going to be from Isaiah 11, uh, 10 to 12. And I'll read the, the verses. In that day, the sprig of Jesse, who stands for an ensign to the peoples, shall be sought by the nations, and his rest, rest shall be glorious. In that day, my Lord will again raise his hand to reclaim the remnant of his people, those who shall be left out of Assyria, Egypt, Patrot, Kash, Cush, Elam, Shinar, Hamath, and the islands of the sea. He will raise an ensign to the nations and assemble the exile of Israel. He will gather the scattered of Judah from the four directions of the earth. So now you mentioned in chapter 10 and 11 are parallel chapters, right? Who are showing us those two figures, one who one hand who does the destruction, other hand of, of deliverance, and who does the, the gathering of Israel, right, Abraham? Yes. So those two chapters are next to each other for a purpose. They're juxtaposed with each other, where while the king of Assyria is, is going around conquering the world, which he succeeds in doing, um, at the same time, the Lord's end time servant who prepares the way for the coming of the Lord among the, Lord, among the house of Israel, that is among the Jews and ten tribes and Lamanites of today, the natural lineages um, of Israel. Um, he is, he is seeking to reclaim them with the help of Ephraimite Gentiles uh, who are intended to be saviors of their people and in the book, in the book of in the, all the scriptures. And so, yes, the raising of the hand here is in parallel with the raising the ensign to the nations. He's the sprig of Jesse and uh, a descendant of David. 
the sin of jealousy and um, also called the root of jealousy. And he comes along at the time when the olive tree is not bearing good fruit, chapter 11, verse 1. And that's another lesson in itself. But uh, yes, his job is to gather Israel. And he does so in a new exodus from the four directions of the world of both Israel and Judah in verse 12. Israel is the 10 tribe kingdom of the north, and Judah is the kingdom of Judah, the southern kingdom, if you know your history. That was taken captive by Babylon. Uh, anciently, the 10 tribes were taken captive into Assyria by the king of Assyria, anciently. So they come from the four directions to lands of inheritance, to Zion, um, and while the one, while destruction is going on worldwide, the king, I mean, the uh, Lord's end time servant is, is um, bringing home the Lord's people as well to Zion and renewing their covenant with the Lord and so forth, so that then the Lord can come to a people who have established Zion, because he can't come until they do that. And, and Zion is never established among Latter-day Saints, it's established among the house of Israel, if you read Third Nephi, where Jesus talks about that. And, uh, and when his people, like when Enoch established Zion, then the Lord could come to Zion, his Zion. His Zion and, and so it is that's the pattern for the end time as well. So when Zion is finally established um, by the Lord's forerunner, in this case, um, the servant, then the Lord can come. And that's basically how the book of Isaiah ends on that note. Uh, Marcy, do you have any comments on this? I, I guess my, my comment is, do you, have, do you have thoughts on what can ease people's burden or fear with just the, the idea of this end time destruction, right? Like, um, I think that people prefer, like you said earlier, not to even think about this. And, and what is it that you do personally, maybe to not feel overwhelmed by the notion of this in the future? That's for Abraham, right? <laughs> Either of you, you know, like uh, what, Rafa, what do you do, you know? It's your turn, Well, well, one thing to me that I they have no idea because she, I can pray for protection, uh, but then I realize that there is a whole theology for protection based on covenants, and I need to say this just came because of Abraham's work on the Davidic covenant, which the servant um, is going to um, be a representation of that. You read Isaiah thirty-seven, which Abraham probably will cover that um, later that we, we see that it's because of the, in Isaiah 37, 35, um, that it's because of the Davidic covenant that the Lord will protect his people. And that opened a whole world for me to understand covenant uh, relationship with the Lord. And we have given so much in the Book of Mormon from that. And that's been to me something that is, is a hope that the Lord, he's bound to do what he tell us he will do, uh, his promises, when we understand terms of the covenant. And, and, and through covenant, he can act, he can deliver, he can protect. Also, because of covenant breaking, all of this happens, all of the judgment and consequences. Uh, but um, that is something that the word of Isaiah, the word Isaiah means God is salvation. And in, in 3 Nephi 20, uh, verse 10 and 11, the Lord said that the words of Isaiah are the fulfillment of the covenants that he did with the house of Israel. And now we're going to see it's all about these covenants, uh, personal covenants, his covenants that he did with the house of Israel. Uh, it's a beautiful thing. Um, am I right, Abraham? Well, you just hit, hit, hit it on the head because when Nephi says that they've taken many plain and precious parts of the scriptures and also many covenants of the Lord have they taken away, he says there's two things in parallel. And knowing Hebrew parallelisms, you have to equate one with the other. So that tells you that the plain and precious parts are those covenants of the Lord. And when the great and vulnerable church, um, you know, the Jews, the Jews gave these things, passed these things in their purity, they came from the impurity from the from the Jews to the Gentiles, the scriptures say. But then the great abominable church took out many planets. 
took out the covenants of the Lord so that and, and, and made people beholden to the church, you know. And we have to be very careful about that today. There are still many plain and precious parts that we have cho chosen to ignore. Yes, we have covenants in our temple ordinances, and they are indeed wonderful, but do we understand how they work? Because they are manifestations of the Davidic covenant, which is all about proxy saviors emulating Christ for people's temporal salvation, or in other words, their physical protection. And in the end time, that really becomes important because the Lord promises, like you said, he's bound to protect his people physically when they do, when they keep the, term, the terms of the covenant. And the terms of the covenant are his commandments, but not just the basic commandments, but taking on, taking on our role as saviors. This is what Doctrine and Covenant says, if we're not saviors, we will be assaulted, lost at saver. And, uh, and we stand in danger of becoming that if we don't assume. The fullness of the gospel is in the Book of Mormon, but it's in the roles it's in the role of the saviors in the Book of Mormon. They are living the fullness of the gospel. This, the sons of Helaman, Nephi, the, I mean, the sons of Messiah, Nephi, the son of Helaman, um, Alma and Amalek and others, they were amazing people because they took it on. They took on, they took on the whole role of the fullness of the gospel, the three Nephites. Um, if we don't get, if you don't start measuring up to them and, and becoming like them, we'll be as salt as lots of saber. This is good for nothing but to be trodden under foot, as I said. And those are the warnings, and those are the, also the promises. The promises are glorious. There, there could not be any more glorious promises in this offer to the Latter day Saints, because the Father is merciful to the Gentiles. It says over and over again, the Father is merciful to the Gentiles. But if they harden their hearts, well, that's on their own head then from then on. Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and, that, and one more that thing that I. Helps. Marcy? Yeah, I, yeah, that's great. I just one more thought. I there is another theme in Isaiah that I'm sure you'll address in other weeks, but it's that theme of dissension before ascension. And I think both individually and collectively, there is a, there are things that this earth provides, which is um, it's a teaching earth, right? It's hardship, it's hard things that hopefully that pressure gives you the opportunity to become better and to be able then to ascend. And I think that um, while deliverance is there and it's certainly eternal salvation is a potential, there's going to be hard things. And I do think that there is the misnomer that kind of goes around of, well, we're a righteous people, therefore we won't, we'll be protected from all the hardships of the end days. And I think I, I hate to say this, but my hardships over the last 20 years, it's really hard because I'm not out of them. So it's hard to say like, well, that was really good for me. Yay me. But, you know, I do understand the concept of when you do hard things, but you consistently look towards the savior, it's for your good to hopefully become more like him. So hard things at the end days. Yeah, it still doesn't mean you're unrighteous when you have to do hard things. It means that it can be for your individual or as a group, it can be for your good to become more like him. That the Abraham has um, also mentioned in, in his writing so much on that decent phase, like you mentioned before ascent, because there are different uh, spiritual levels that we didn't cover. Um, but it's, it's all in, for example, a, a book that Abraham wrote I, called Isaiah the Coreb. Uh, when we see in Isaiah 7, spiritual levels, and it usually you want to go higher, you need to have a decent face, and which is a blessing. It's a blessing to go through them, and then, yeah, allow us to, to go higher. Uh, I don't know, Abraham, if you want to expound on some of that, uh, as Mark mentioned that. Touch on a little bit, if you want to ascend from, from a Jacob Israel level to a Zion Jerusalem level in Isaiah, yeah, you you have to be tried and tested every which way to see if you'll keep commandments, the Lord's commandments on that particular level. And these commandments are the terms of his of one of his covenants. So if we want to ascend closer to God's image and likeness and be reborn to a higher spiritual level, uh, yes, then, then we need, the higher we go, the greater will be the descent phase that precedes our ascent phase or our, our re regeneration to a, you know, a rebirth to a, to, to closer to God's image and likeness. And of course, Jesus descended below all to, to ascend above all to his father's throne. So 
he's our exemplar in this whole scenario. Maybe we don't, maybe we should end on that note, should we? All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, we can ask you one more question because I know this is a question that people ask a lot with when we mention that the end time servant. Um, do you have uh, an idea of how he's not come to the picture? Because we 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 believe uh, we have a church today, um, and just Smith mentioned about him. Uh, by the way, so it's not something that's too foreign for, from our, our theology, but he's going to come, and a lot of people are concerned, I will recognize him, how do we know who his servant will be, and so on. And I think that will be a, a good question to address, and then we, we can call the... That is uh, in our third video discussion, Rodolfo, about, it's all about servant, let's well, we, title it, the servant of the Lord. And, uh, and he's an important figure, yeah, and, and, and many say, well, that's Joseph Smith. Well, no, it's not about the time of Joseph Smith. Well, then they say, well, that's Jesus Christ. But no, the Lord, the Lord himself is never called a servant anywhere in the scriptures. Um, he, he takes upon himself the form of a servant, as Paul says. But no, the word servant has to be understood in terms of being a, a proxy savior. And, and Jesus takes upon himself the form of a proxy savior in obtaining his people's spiritual salvation. But the Lord's end time servant who prepares the way before him the service as a proxy savior for his people's temporal salvation, for the physical protection of the Jews, 10 tribes and Lamanites who come out of Babylon on the eve of its destruction and, and they are led to Zion, where it, which is a place of safety. And, and that's what that is all about. We will cover that in, a, in, a, in, a, in one of the next videos. Yeah, so stay tuned for that one. Next video is going to be about um, the day of the Lord and cover the block of uh, Isaiah 30, uh, 13 to 39. Uh, but uh, let me tell you, thank you so much, Marcy. It's been a pleasure to have you uh, and, and all your insights and, and your perspective. And thank you so much, Abraham. And we will see you in the next video. Well, thank you, Rodolfo. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you. Bye.